The details and analysis of this vase that you'll see in this video will demonstrate the irremediable truth of work involved in its manufacturing. The cold, hard facts of the geometric precision achieved in its creation. The implications of this truth on the debate around the existence of ancient high technology are utterly profound. And when it comes to any objection or coherent responses to this data, it's been radio silence. Well, here it is, the video that so many of you requested for the last few months, my evaluation of Uncharted X's precision vase. Now, for those of you who aren't aware, Ben from Uncharted X likes to talk about this vase here. He's had it measured a few different times now and claims that it shows signs of precision manufacturing. In short, he claims that it was made by the type of machinery we would see today, like computer control. He likes to say five-point CNC machines a lot. He's talking about modern manufacturing techniques that went into these. He's recently had it light scanned. He's also had it measured with dial indicators similar to this one here. Now I tend to find myself in the middle on this whole lost civilization Atlantis hunting debate. I've got videos that criticize Graham Hancock. I've got videos that criticize World of Antiquity. I've criticized uh, Bright Insight. I've criticized Mini Minute Man. My point is that this is the kind of thing that I just go into this and I look at the data. I don't really have a team that I'm like, oh, I'm going to make all my buddies over here happy. I, I know that some people are going to be happy with what I find and other people aren't, and that's just how it goes with every one of these things. Now, one more thing to mention before we go into this. Like so many other Egyptian artifacts that are in private hands, the provenance on this is pretty sketchy. Uh, Dr. Miano and Night Scarab both have made videos discussing this, and uh, you may, have, may not have seen that, but... I'm In this video, I'm going to ignore the provenance aspect of it. As far as I'm concerned, you can basically consider this something that me and Ben went and found ourselves in Saqqara. We dug it up. We know it's 5,000 years old. The Egyptian government said, man, you guys have some really bitchin' hair. You can take this with you and study it all you want. And we know this is an Egyptian vase. For the purpose of this video, that's how I'm going to treat it. I'm just going to be looking at the methods used to gain, gain their measurements data, the measurement data itself, and the implications of that data. Hi, I'm Dan, and welcome to Dunking. The vase that was scanned is um, the property of a friend of ours, and he had it scanned through a company out in Connecticut named Capture 3D, and they used a GOME ATOS structured light scanner to produce the STL file, which Nick and I then did a full inspection in a soft software called Polyworks. Mm -hmm. So another company was hired to do the 3D light scan, and that information was edited by Alex and Nick. Now, they didn't call it editing the video. They called it a full inspection. Nick and I then did a full inspection in a soft software called Polyworks. Hmm. Now, that's the son of Chris Dunn, Chris being the author of Giza Power Plant, and he's definitely a proponent of high technology in ancient Egypt. So it, there is, we're pointing out that there is a bit of a conflict of interest here. Now, Dr. Miano mentioned it, and I'm not going to go into it at length here, but it is worth mentioning out the gate that there is a little bit of a conflict of interest here. In October of 2023, the vase owners and engineering team met in Danville, Illinois, to do a hands-on metrology inspection on a number of vases, with me tagging along to document the day. Led by Chris Dunn, Alex Dunn, and Nick Sierra, along with the vase owners, as well as engineers and executive staff from Danville Metal Stamping, several vases were put through an array of inspection, looking at concentricity, roundness, continuity, and wall thickness. Now, in addition to the 3D light scans, we're also fortunate enough that Ben's provided us with some video of them actually taking physical measurements with those dial indicators. And that's a lot easier for us to visually see the precision or lack thereof when we're looking at each piece compared to the light scan that's just a picture in some software. Now, Ben frequently points out that the lug handles would be the most difficult part for them to produce accurately. And he also likes to say things like this. You still have to explain the most difficult aspects of any artifact, particularly if you think that they were somehow made by butt flap wearing dudes rubbing on them with sand and rocks. So let's start at the lug handles and we'll just see what the data says. <laughs> the question of whether it's turned, I mean, some of these look like they were, but it doesn't explain the lug handles. You would have had to remove that That's and right. make sure that the contours are the exact same measurements as everything else, which without turning it. So if you can do that, why would you turn it to begin with? 
it would yeah if we were to do this today in the shop it would be an initial turn with the geometry for the lug handles as one which yeah. would then come back with a mill mm -hmm. to finish between the lug handles yeah. yeah that um that was a question i had which would be if we were yeah. to try and make this today how would we do it and i assume it would be yeah a combination be a of lathe and then like five axis cnc yeah. yep. high-end machine now, despite Alex claiming that they would mill granite here, which isn't possible, the rest of what they say here is pretty accurate. If they were to make this today, they would leave a large lip of material where they made the handles, and then they would be able to carve that down either by hand or, in Ben's case, he would think it with a machine, but it would be removed after the fact, which is why Ben focuses on these as a more enigmatic or difficult-to-make feature. You can't just spin this and polish it and carve it and get what you want. You would actually have to, after the fact, take it down and fix it, which is why they focus so heavily on the measurements which is why we're starting there lug handle one is designated as datum f yep um and that is what we use on lug handle two in that parallelism uh call out so to each other parallel they're seven thousandths of an inch uh parallel we're looking at the parallelism of those cylinders the lug handles to that top flat and the lug handle one is a thousandth of an inch parallel and mm. the lug handle two is five thousandths of an inch parallel you have both of those being reported as three thousandths of an inch perpendicular to that uh center cylinder these measurements are extremely good for an ancient artifact i mean human visual acuity on average is about three thousandths of an inch and we have some of these measurements that are down to a single thousandth of an inch and that's amazing because that would be invisible to almost every human being on the planet but there is a disparity on the screen. There's a problem with the data between those two handles. There's a huge disparity. If you look closely, you'll notice it. And it's not in the measurements themselves. It's in the number of reference points taken. And this is where we're going to start to go into some weeds. One handle has 4,325 data points. The other one has 3,802 reference points. That's a difference of over 10%. Now, there is some junk data that's created when these scans are taken. So it's very, very common. As a matter of fact, a standard operating procedure for them to go in and edit some out with that editing software. The rotation table is positioned. A scan is made. Data is collected. The scanner is repositioned. Additional rotation cycles are executed. And the entire process is repeated until we finally have enough data collected on the surfaces we're interested in. The last step in the process is to remove all of the bad data. We can see all of the islands that are not connected to the main portion of the mesh. Most of these islands are bad data that can be deleted. So while there almost certainly wouldn't be an identical number of reference points when you have this many, 10% is a very, very, very high disparity. I mean, look how little was removed from that wave bird that I showed you that the guy was doing. Less than 1%, I would say, of those data points were bad. But here in this case, 10% are removed. Um, you know, that, that might not sound like a whole heck of a lot, but like, like check out Fox McCloud here, and he's all closing in on Andros. You know, Andros has about 40 reference points. I wonder what would happen if we eliminated four of those. Well, look at that. With just 10% of the reference points gone, I can make whatever the hell I want. Now, obviously, this caused me to look a lot closer at how the data was gathered, and that seems to be where the issue is. When Nick says that they did a full inspection, meaning that they edited the data... Nick and I then did a full inspection in a sof software called Polyworks. Hmm. This is very clearly them editing the data. I mean, it's normal, it's a standard thing for them to do to go in and remove some faulty data points, but this looks like way more than it should be. Way, way, way more than it should be. And this is the only time that you are ever gonna find that in these scans where you have the two halves of the vase separate. Now this is the only data set in the original project that's cut in half like this. Usually it's the, like the entire top or the entire bottom or the entire center, but with the lug handles, it's the left and the right. So you can see this disparity in data points. Even though that thing was on a table that was spinning perfectly and didn't move, except for the spin, so it should have identical pictures if you have identical handles, there's a 10% difference, over 10% difference in reference points. So 
this is kind of a smoking gun for if there was any manipulation done in this editing, if it was done under the, t under the board, this is the smoking gun for it. And it seems that they thought so too, because when they did this the next time, they didn't do the next vase's handle separately. They put them together as one measurement for the handle. So you can't see that how many data points they did or didn't eliminate. Basically, my point here is after, as soon as I looked at the handles and saw this, these measurements meant a whole lot less to me than the men message, uh, measurements we're going to get from the dial indicators. But we're going to go ahead and compare the two. Now, it, it's funny, even Mark Vist and anybody who looks at the pictures and stuff tends to come away with the opinion that the handles look uneven. And I don't really care what the photographs look like, but other people that have examined them, like Mark, come away with it saying, you know, I, I think that these handles are a little uneven. But not the scan data. The scan data says that they're super duper duper even. So when Ben says that the handles are remarkable. We examined the lug handles in the last video. They were some of the most remarkable features on the vase itself. He's been hoodwinked. The data has been doctored to make the single digit thousands when there actually is a two digit thousands. It's the data. There's no question in my mind what's happened to the 500 or so missing data points they have been selectively removed in order to make the vase seem more symmetrical than it really is. That's the most obvious explanation given the missing data points and the disparity between the measurements on the scan and the physical measurements that we see with the dial indicators. Even relative to each other, the lug handles are parallel within the width of a couple of human hairs. That's not what the dial indicators show. Uh, my dad's a retired machinist, so he loaned me a dial indicator. He uses them all the time. And uh, basically, the way that these things work is, is each point on this thing is a half of a thousandth. Um, the fives and the tens and whatnot are the five and ten thousandths. Um, when you press the needle, it goes up or down. Um, bends in this video will be preloaded, where basically they'll push the thing in partially, and then they'll turn this knob up here to zero. So by zeroing it out that way then when it goes up or down you can measure the disparity either direction so that it's not just measuring the difference in one direction and so keep an eye closely as we go forward because we're going to be watching a lot of these things turning and you need to know what you're looking at now see how the second handles reading slowly moves across the dial now look closely here there's more than a single thousandth it's far off from the zero reading that they got on the other handle there's no question that the handles are not symmetrical but the scan with all the missing data points said that they were. And those so. are cylinders made out of thousands of points. Yeah, I think the point count should be up there. Like, for, yeah, yeah, for, yeah, like, yeah 4,200 yeah. on one and 3,800. So, you know, your typical CMM, we would probably only take six to eight points. So the fewer points you take, honestly, the more accurate your geometry is going to appear. Yeah. Um, but once again, I, we want to be as thorough as we can in our investigations. Mm -hmm. Using tons of data points in theory should be a good thing. But in practice, when we know that they're selectively removing them or that it's highly suspect, it's just a way for them to hide that. Oh, look, we used 10,000 data points. I mean, we gathered 11,000, but we threw 1,000 of them away to make it look the way we wanted. But, dude, check it out, 10,000 data points. You know how accurate that is? It's a lot of trees to hide it. Yeah, That's I cool. mean, we could we could fudge, uh, not fudge, but, uh, you know, we, we could we could take, we could make decisions to make the geometry appear yep. more precise than it is, but the precision of it already is, I think, yeah. enough to prove our oh, point. Yeah. 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 It's no surprise it took him four years from the time the scans were taken till the time the editing was done. I mean, look at what he just said right there. He basically point blank stopped himself from saying we can do whatever the F we want. And the, oh, we didn't, we, 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 we better dial that back. And watch Alex say basically the same kind of thing. Um, and I, I will say also the, the data with this, we didn't go out of our way to exclude a lot of uh points and you know this is a 5000 year old base there's some deviations in this i think at this point you'll agree that the scan data is suspect now that doesn't mean that these things aren't precise it just means that what we have here was fudged so let's go through and look at the data that nick was or excuse me that ben was kind enough to provide with the video footage of them using dial indicators on other parts of the base we'll just go through really quickly and compare them really fast
this area could not have been shaped by turning the vase on a lathe on its axis. It had to be machined out with a different process. Another tooling process would need to be employed, meaning you lose positional calibration with a process change, and that would show up in the level of precision measured. This is certainly true for even modern machining methods that involve tool and process changes. As reported from the scans and my second video, and now confirmed from the physical inspection, no significant deviation in precision is found in the area of the vase body between the lug handles. The vase body in between the lug handles tested out in line with the other datum points for this vase with a run out of around eight to ten thousandths of an inch in spots and the majority being three to four thousandths. Hey, this is Dan in Post, and I've been using Ben's website to get each one of the images I've been showing you here with the scan data. And when I went to do the area between the lug handles, I had to source it from the video because it's, for some reason, no longer on his website. Now, it and the lug handles themselves are the two areas in the scan data that are extremely inaccurate. So, um, I'm wondering why one of those is gone and not the other one. I mean, we talk about the lug handles all the time, so I'm guessing you can't really take that down without people noticing. But that area in between, it just kind of disappeared. You can draw your own conclusions from that little tidbit of knowledge. So most of these are close enough. I mean, the lug handles are the one area where we see a really big disparity in the measurements between the scan data and the dial indicators. As a matter of fact, we do see some really tight tolerances on some of this stuff. You have to admit that this is really, really good work. I can't argue with the fact that this would be considered precision if it was handmade or made on an old school lathe. But does it measure up to modern day machining standards? Well, those of you who've worked around precision lathes or in machine shops and stuff will have almost certainly noticed something when we were watching those, my, uh, those dial indicators go up and down. Look closely right here with a run out of around eight to ten thousandths of an inch in spots and the majority being three to four thousandths. I'm gonna move my gauge down so it touches and I'm gonna zero it out. So I'm putting zero where the needle is right now. And I'm gonna just spin it and see how crooked it is. It's not bad at all. I can see it goes out right here. You won't be able to get it perfect if it's a rough piece, but once you do a pass on it, you could retry it and it'll be much smoother and you'll be able to get it dialed in. This is the kind of precision we don't see on a lathe used to make working parts. It's the kind of precision that we see used on a lathe made to say, turn a vase. Here is a lathe that's being used to make a stone vase in the modern day. Now where the lathe grabs onto the material that it's cutting is called the chuck, that area has a lot of wobble in this because it doesn't need to be precise. Compare that to this metal cutting lathe. Notice that the chuck has no wobble. It doesn't have any play. It doesn't move at all. One of these will give you a dial indicator reading that goes up and down, up and down as you go around the object. The other one will give you a perfectly flat reading as you go around. One would be modern day precision. The other one would be, looks pretty good. So while there's no question in my mind that this was turned on a lathe, it wasn't a very precise one, certainly not by modern standards. And 5-point CNC and milling and all that stuff, that's just out. There is no computerized perfection in here whatsoever. Now Ben explains this with the variation in the stuff that makes up the granite itself. You know, there's inclusions, he says, and these cause you know, the variations in the cutting and the tooling and whatnot. As mentioned in the clip, and as you might have seen in some of the other gauge movements, in particular location, the gauge dial suddenly spikes a few thousands, three, four or five, very quickly, before returning to what you might call a more normalized sweep range just as quickly. We discussed this during the inspections, and there are a couple possibilities, as it only seems to occur in very small spots in the material when the indicator tip runs over them. The first possibility is damage. Another possibility is that it's due to the nature of granite itself, and a chunk of material, a quartz inclusion, for example, was ripped out in the machining process, forming a small divot, 
or it wasn't cut cleanly relative to the other softer material in the granite. But there's inclusions on the precision granite tabletop that he knows is perfectly smooth that he's working on right there. There's inclusions in it. They were able to smooth those out to thousandths of an inch. They could easily have done the same on this vase if they needed to or if they were using the proper tools that could. But they didn't. It's quite obvious. The up and down play is the kind of thing you only get from a, a, a lathe with a little bit of wobble. That's the only way you're going to get that. Right there. Uh, so. Maybe I can get right down on the level here. Yeah, I do now, yeah. 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 So that's a 2000. Oh, okay. Right. Right. Another gap. And then. Yeah. Do it without the hand. And it's just, yeah, the game enough. Dead level, right? mm -hmm. So if they had the granite spinning on a perfect axis and they put the exact same amount of pressure on it with the polishing agent, they could smooth it out to a perfect degree. It wouldn't be wobbling up and down like what we see. Straight up, it's just a product of a low quality lathe. In some ways, the vase is similar to the golden record fixed to the side of the Voyager spacecraft. On the side of it is a golden record, with pictures and mathematics depicting our species, our technology, capability and location. Analysis of the vase is revealing similar secrets about its creators. And who knows what there is yet to find. While Voyager, with its golden disc, was sent through space, the vase, with its encoded messages, has been sent through time. Now the idea that there's data encoded in this vase is quite a stretch. I mean, there were literally thousands of these things found and we happen to measure the right one or, they, or they've got all the data encoded in all of these even though they're all different shapes and sizes. I mean, personally, I think this is like the quintessential example of that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. But I'd like to evaluate all the data with it on screen, but Mark Fist cried about um, Dr. David Miano using his image in his thumbnail for his video, so I'm a little leery of him coming and trying to copyright strike my video because I don't have a whole lot of nice things to say about his work, so I won't be using too many screenshots of it, sorry. His main position is there's a relationship between all of the major circles in the vase and that this ratio defines the relationship between all of the different circle sizes and whatnot. Uh, basically, to quote him, with this elegant construction, we can account for the majority of the circular features in the object. <sighs> Literally, the only circles he's using here are the lug handles. All the rest of the circles that he's using to make this are manufactured circles that he's getting from different ways of looking at the data, which I've already shown you the way that scanning does. You can set these things up. The axis can be moved all over the point. You can make circles in a number of different places, as a matter of fact. In his previous work on this exact same vase, Mark made circles in different places because it behooved him to do so then. So he's using one set of circles. This would be like me saying that the size of the circles on my automobile are all related to each other with the same elegant proportions. And by circles on my car, I just mean the steering wheel, not the tires, not anything else that's around on the entire car. No, 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 no none of those count, just the steering wheel. Every other circle is one that I made up. But it's magic math, dude. Trust me, it's a message from the future. This is just... <sighs> and next he tries to claim that the circles that are excluded incorporate pi and the golden ratio. And that magically you get the 16 gigahertz wave as it propagates in a vacuum. Which is basically just a way for him to grab at whatever old numbers that he wants to put this whole thing together. But I'll give you a real example because check it out. I found similar stuff in my PlayStation 2. It's amazing. The depth of a PS2 system is 7 inches. 7 times pi equals 21.9905. The length of the console is 11.75 inches. 21.9905 divided by 11.75 equals 1.8715. 1.8715 is a type of structural steel used to construct skyscrapers. The length of the system is 11.75 inches. The power switch in front is 0.5 inches long. The power switch in back is 0.625 inches long. 
combined length of power switch is 1.125 inches. 11.75 plus 1.125 equals 12.875. 12.875 times the golden ratio of 1.618 gives a total of 20.8375. Almost exactly the number of hundreds of tons of steel used in the World Trade Center. Findings Sony coded the structural steel and the amount used in the World Trade Center in the dimensions of the PlayStation 2 console. Conclusion Sony did 9-11 well, obviously this is a joke, but the point here is very real. If you just play with the numbers, you can come up with whatever the hell you want. And that's why Mark has two different works about this. The second one is supplanted the first. The first is old, but both of them have the same claim. This couldn't be the product of chance. This has to be by design. And you know what? I agree with him. If you get in there and you massage the numbers really good, you get what you want. This certainly isn't a product of chance. Mark did this. This is just number games. This is just, you, you start adding numbers like pi and the golden ratio and start targeting wavelengths, you end up with like all kinds of numbers. And as I just demonstrated, you can just build whatever effing case you want. Now, you know, for all the skepticism that I've shown Ben throughout this video, I don't think he's a bad guy and I don't think that he's a grifter. Matter of fact, I think he's done a real service here. I think that I want to see other vases that have better provenance tested because the lathe is supposed to have been invented in Egypt around 1300 BC. That's what it shows up. So maybe a little before that, maybe 2000 BC. But this would push it back to like 3000, 4000, 5000 BC, way on back, depending on the vases that we found and stuff. I mean, this has the potential to really rewrite some aspects of ancient technology. Not in the way Ben wants, sorry, but still in a very real, very important way. And this is the kind of thing that makes me think that, you know, a lot of these guys that are into this kind of stuff, this kind of all woo crap, it's not all bad, man, especially when they get in there like this and go in there swinging. He provided some solid data, and, and if this data shows up across the board, like I said, if, if we can test other vases with better provenance and see this kind of thing borne out, it's going to change when the lathe was built in ancient Egypt or invented in ancient Egypt or whatever, and, and that's valuable. It's not the kind of value Ben wanted. It's not the kind of value Ben's fans want. But it's the kind of value that this kind of thinking has traditionally brought to science and continues to do so. So, Grifter? Hell no. He has done a service to the community here. And with that, I'm going to say goodbye. You know, I could talk about this for a while. There's a lot of aspects of, like, market manipulation that really... I, I thought about dipping my toes into here because one dude buying a bunch of vases and the prices keep going up and then it's like, oh, look, I got a bunch of these vases. Do, do, do. <laughs> yeah, we've never seen that before for those of you that, that collect old crap. You've never seen anything like that happen in recent times, huh? But anyway, I chose not to. I wanted to, to focus on the part of it that that basically everybody else had ignored. So thank you all very much. Thanks, Special thanks to my patrons and we will see you guys next time. And in the 80s, trying to sell that sort of stuff onto the antiquities market it wouldn't have been worth very much. I mean, honestly, since we've done these vase videos, I know I've driven up the, like, these videos have driven up the price of vases. Yeah. <laughs> you can just ask Matt, like, the guy's been buying them. He's like, God damn it. Like, he talks to these antiquities dealers, like, yeah, we're getting so many inquiries about vases now. Like, all the prices <laughs> have doubled or tripled for these vases that are on the market. Dang it.